Welcome to the Marin Media Lecture Series. I'm delighted to be your host this evening. I'm Peter B. Collins. Tonight we're going to talk about the pervasive surveillance state in the United States of America. We've just survived what I've called the summer of leaks. Ed Snowden, who was working for the NSA contractor Booz Allen Hamilton, dropped a whole cache of documents on media outlets, most prominently Glenn Greenwald and the British newspaper The Guardian. And Ed Snowden's releases, his revelations, have confirmed much of what we had ideas about over the last six or seven years. And before I introduce our guest, I just want to reference this book that was published in 2005. A courageous former technician who worked for AT&T in San Francisco named Mark Klein witnessed the conversion of a room at an AT&T building on Folsom Street in San Francisco into a secure secret room, access limited only to people with security clearances and employees of the National Security Agency. In this book, Mark Klein disclosed that the switch that was installed at Folsom Street and many other locations, we think as many as 25 across the country, diverted the entire load of traffic that came through this very powerful switching station, emails, cell phone calls, landline calls, some international calls, all that traffic was diverted to an unknown location controlled by the NSA. That was the first inkling that I got about the dragnet surveillance that began after 9-11 and has been regularized and retroactively, in some cases, there have been attempts to legalize what I consider to be the unconstitutional actions of our government in direct violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Our guest this evening is Heidi Bogosian. She is the executive director of the National Lawyers Guild, a very important organization. And she's published this new book called Spying on Democracy. And it's an excellent review and a, a very comprehensive look at the surveillance apparatus that has been developed in the United States. Her book is subtitled, Government Surveillance, Corporate Power, and Public Resistance. Heidi, welcome to our program this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Tell me, first of all, what your interpretation of the Fourth Amendment is, and how far out of compliance is the United States government? The Fourth Amendment, as lawyers and I think a lot of activists are acutely aware, was designed to prevent the kind of general writs that we had uh, in the colonial days when citizens uh, were routinely, routinely found their houses being searched uh, by the British. And the Fourth Amendment was designed to protect uh, the citizenry from unreasonable governmental searches and seizures. The vast gathering of data without our knowledge and without judicial warrant or approval by a neutral magistrate is in clear violation of uh, the fundamental values of the Fourth Amendment, namely that we have the right to be private, to decide what information we want to give, and that a warrant shall issue only upon probable cause that a crime has been or is about to be committed. So. Uh, I think we've gone far astray from those fundamental values, and hopefully the current revelations will wake people up to the extent that corporations are partnering with the government in doing that. Do you regard Edward Snowden as the Dan Ellsberg of our time? Well, Dan Ellsberg himself has said that these are uh, more important revelations even than the Pentagon Papers. So uh, to many of us, Mr. Snowden is a hero. He uh, came forward knowing uh, that he could possibly face life in prison for what he did, but had access as a private contractor, as you mentioned, working with the government, 
And about 70% of our intelligence uh, functions are now contracted out. Mm -hmm. So I think he saw that things were happening in great secrecy. Uh, corporations, in effect, were serving as the long arm in the government and getting around the Fourth Amendment protections and felt he had a duty to come forward. And it's opened up a window of dialogue and hopefully an opportunity to address some serious infractions. I think 10 years from now, we'll look back and regard Ed Snowden as, as a great American who was a little weak on the fugitive part. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But to me, one of the fundamental issues that the documentation that Ed Snowden has supplied, some of which, only a fraction, really has been published. There are tens of thousands of documents, we're told. And even the uh, PowerPoint slideshow of the PRISM program, we've only seen about eight. We know that there are somewhere between 35 and 40 slides. And even The Guardian, which has taken risks, is unwilling to publish those. So uh, we can only speculate about any sort of pressure that's been put on them or their own judgments that have led, men, led them to uh, withhold the balance of that information. I believe that what we're going to see continuing in the next months and the next years uh, is more information coming out. We heard recently about the so-called Hemisphere Project. How that information came out was in an activist named Drew in Washington State who's part of a lawsuit that's actually quite significant involving the U.S. Army spying on activists, peace activists, and aiming to destroy their organizations, uh, which they have done, uh, engaging in a pattern of harassing local activists, uh, infiltrating their groups by the local fusion center. And fusion centers are entities that were created by the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 in an effort to better streamline and improve our intelligence gathering capacities. I think in part uh, in response to some of the 9-11 Commission recommendations. But it's interesting because fusion centers not only involve different levels of law enforcement agencies, but they also work in close partnership with corporations, and they share personal data. Uh, so what happened was Drew Hendricks, his name is, uh, filed Freedom of Information Act requests, and by accident, uh, government officials included information about Project Hemisphere. What Project Hemisphere does is have the government pay AT&T employees to sit along with uh, drug enforcement agency officials, and they can comb through AT&T records that date back as far as 26 years. The problem with this is that it's not a judicial warrant that allows access. It's an administrative subpoena from the DEA. Mm -hmm. And the question that raises is how many other administrative agencies are doing that kind of probing? I think we're going to find out uh, that in many ways, programs exist on different levels that are invading our privacy. I've done a series of interviews with an investigative journalist named Bo Hodai, H-O-D-A-I is how he spells his last name, and he publishes uh, in part through the Center for Media and Democracy in Madison, Wisconsin. You can find their website at prwatch.org. And what Hodai has done using public documents and public records is established how the fusion centers that you referred to collaborated with the Phoenix Police Department and in turn with corporate security entities to, and this is my term, to roll up the Occupy movement in Phoenix. Now one of the things that Hodai points out is that, that Phoenix had a very small Occupy movement. There were more cops trying to infiltrate and monitor Occupy Phoenix than there were protesters or, or activists. Yet they inserted an undercover cop who uh, advocated for violence and, and what he called anarchism. And then they used off-duty Phoenix Police Department officers to uh, essentially uh, form a kind of, not invisible, but uh, below the surface connection between the taxpayer-funded intelligence 
some of which has been derived from the expanded powers of the Patriot Act, the national security letters that the FBI can write for itself without a judge's approval. And so the completion of this circle where First Amendment activists were identified and they, they were named to the corporate security people against whom they were protesting. <laughs> so they, you know, the uh, Occupy people put up on Facebook, we're going to uh, uh, occupy Chase Bank tomorrow. Well, the police department would read the Facebook post, would notify the security for that bank, hey, Occupy is coming tomorrow. And this has been taken to a new level with the Fusion Center in North Dakota, which is uh, uh, preparing for expected protests of the Keystone XL pipeline. They already have photo sheets and uh, uh, lists of people who they expect to be protesters, even though they haven't arrived. And they're sharing that information with the security officials of Keystone, of, of I'm sorry, TransCanada, which is not even an American company. Right. And so this reaches a level where we're so far removed from the Bill of Rights and the fundamental protections there that it's, it's astounding. What you say happened with the Occupy movement, not just in that state, but in every state. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security met with financial uh, representatives from banking and other institutions in nearly every state before Occupy started, warning them that they, they had found out there were going to be protests taking place. And we've seen that at events such as the Republican National Convention, the Democratic National Convention, so-called national special security events. Chicago. Chicago, mm -hmm. where uh, the financial industry works very closely uh, with the police and is kept abreast of what's happening. And I think it raises an important point in terms of so-called terror uh, threats. Uh, we see a lot of funding from DHS and other government entities streaming into local law enforcement groups if the local departments can prove that there are going to be threat assessments, as they're called. So they have to justify that in order to get funding. And so often we now see the so-called anarchist threat as a catch-all mm -hmm. to represent, I believe, protesters and individuals who question the status quo, corporate and government policies alike. Mm -hmm. And it can creep over into crackdowns on thought crimes. Exactly. People who simply express an opinion or a doubt. That's right. And it becomes, uh, I think, along with the trend that we've seen, especially after the events of 9-11, preemptive or predictive policing, where instead of waiting until a crime has occurred, or even a minor infraction, uh, you'll see at protests police engaging in such tactics as unlawful mass arrests, where mm -hmm. they encircle hundreds of protesters, as they did on the Brooklyn Bridge during Occupy, and arrest them. What we see weeks or months or even years later in the news is that, oh, the charges were dropped. Uh, but at often great expense to local municipalities who have to pay for lawsuits mm -hmm. and the individuals who have to come back to appear in court. It's really an affront to the First Amendment. Yeah. There's also an important book that was published this year by Trevor Aronson called The Terror Factory. And in it, he painstakingly reviewed more than 500 individual cases of people who were charged with some form of domestic terrorism since 9-11. He found about five legitimate cases where there was no paid informant, no provocateur, no uh, <coughs> munitions or other uh, supplies were provided by the government. Uh, and, and it's just remarkable. I mean, that's a 0.01% credibility factor. Exactly. And I think what you've said is an important point. The the, the word terrorist and things like terrorism enhancements, which uh, basically can lengthen uh, the prison sentence of an activist, for example, an environmental or an animal rights activist, who the FBI deemed the top domestic terrorism threat in 2005. Many believe it's because these are individuals who've been successful in raising consciousness about social issues and who have affected certain levels of change. Uh, but they become easy targets because they may engage in colorful rhetoric, protected again by the First Amendment, 
and uh, may engage in civil disobedience, uh, uh, property destruction, uh, knowing that there will be penalties, but avoiding harming human life. And we must remember that throughout history in this country, people who engage in civil disobedience are long after heralded as heroes for social change. So I think that we see the term terrorist thrown around, uh, really exploiting fears among the general public, but unfortunately used to stigmatize groups of individuals who were really working for positive social change. We're talking with Heidi Bogosian, and she's with us for this entire hour. If you are watching our live broadcast or stream here on Wednesday evening, the 2nd of October, we invite you to join this conversation. It's interactive, and you can send a question to uh, the website that is listed on your screen. It's cmcm.tv slash citylights. And we will be going to your questions here in a few minutes. So uh, any question or comment you want to submit, we would love to see it, and we will fit in as many as we can. We also have a live studio audience here, and we will come to you for questions in a few minutes. So think of some really good ones, OK? Heidi, Ed Snowden providing all of this documentation for these various surveillance programs that some leakers had given us a snapshot into, he not only gave us the big picture, but I believe, and I want to get your opinion on this, that his documentation blows out the arguments that have dismissed so many cases that challenged the wiretapping programs. All were thrown out more or less because the plaintiffs lacked standing. The court saying that you can't prove that you were wiretapped. Well, that's no longer a, a, a possible argument. There's tons of proof that many innocent Americans have been subject to interception of their communications or other forms of surveillance. Are you hopeful that we will see a new round of litigation that cannot be dismissed by the courts for lack of standing? We already are seeing a new round of litigation, but to take a step back for viewers who may not be aware, several groups such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, the Center for Constitutional Rights, filed lawsuits challenging, as you said, uh, the warrantless wiretapping program that began under George W. Bush. And the courts uh, uniformly said, you lack standing. That is, you cannot prove with a certainty that you were uh, monitored. The problem being that for many of the groups uh, that were involved, such as the Center for Constitutional Rights and other legal organizations that may, for example, be representing Guantanamo detainees or others, it had what we call a chilling effect on their conversations, not only with their clients, families of clients, but also with members of the press. Because when you know that your conversations may be monitored on the telephone or electronically, of course, it changes the nature of what you say, especially in a legal uh, conversation, which is supposed to be covered under the attorney-client privilege. So many of these groups had to modify how they did business. Instead of conducting it on the telephone or internet, they would have to travel to other countries to meet in person with their clients. Uh, many of these are grassroots organizations with limited budgets. So mm -hmm. that uh, creates a, a burden that really interferes with the administration of justice in this country. But fortunately, with the new revelations, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has filed a new class action suit. The National Lawyers Guild happens to be one of the plaintiffs. And basically what they're saying is now that we know that such vast monitoring is in fact taking place, uh, our fears were legitimate. That mm -hmm. things that we did to change our business practices and client, or, client interactions were a burden and interfered with how we conducted justice. Mm -hmm. Heidi, uh, last week, Foreign Policy Magazine published a, a report based on newly declassified materials from the NSA archives. And they've established that some 1,600 Americans were subjected to wiretapping during the Johnson administration. Mostly, they were opponents of the Vietnam War. Most notably, Senator Frank Church, who later chaired the commission that investigated all of those abuses, was a target of that surveillance. And oddly, Howard Baker, the Republican majority leader, 
who was a supporter of the Vietnam War, was also one of those targets. Today I interviewed for my podcast Chris Pyle, who back in 1969 was an Army intelligence officer, and almost single-handedly he exposed the Army's program, which was focused on domestic war protesters and a clear violation of the Army's mission and, and many statutes and, and probably the Constitution. So it, it raises an important issue about the present day because James Bamford wrote a powerful piece in Wired magazine in June after Snowden's first round of revelations and said, General Alexander, Keith Alexander, who runs the NSA, is probably the most powerful man in the world. And because of their collection capabilities, uh, you know, it, it's a, an important thing to investigate. So I've had a number of conversations with NSA whistleblower Russell Tice. We're going to listen right now to an excerpt from one of those conversations. And I'd like to get your reaction, but because what he discloses is that going back to 2004, 2005, before he left the NSA, he was a witness to and also saw written orders for a range of wiretaps, including the current chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Let's listen. Well, at the time, uh, I was finding out that a lot of uh, politicians and judges, to include Supreme Court judges and, and FISA judges and other federal judges, and um, and even people in the executive committee or executive branch, I should say, were being wiretapped by NSA. So one of the one of the individuals, as a as a leader in the United States Senate, was Miss Diane Feinstein, who had her um, her telephones tapped, um, as her as well as her staff. Um, her family phones were tapped. Her congressional offices in in California were were tapped. Um, so they uh, they were very thorough. And in, in, now this was just the phone side. Uh, NSA also uh, went after all of the the uh, communications as far as their computers too. But the information that I had direct uh, you know hands on relationship with were, were the phone numbers that were being tapped and the system that that went after the phone numbers once you plugged in the target. And the target set for this particular time would be. In, Senator Dianne Feinstein. So and what, what was uh, the what was the time frame, Russ, of the uh, surveillance of Senator Feinstein, to your knowledge? It would have been. I don't think I saw her with the satellite stuff. So it would have been. It would have been two thousand four, two thousand five time frame. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and then and, and it continued on, but after two thousand five. Um, I was sort of doing a little kabuki dance with the uh, FBI, so <laughs> it was hard to um, to have any more meetings with our my, my sources at NSA. And it was after that it was just a lot of um, being followed by the FBI. Okay, and so you have direct knowledge that Senator Feinstein was wiretapped starting in 2004 or 2005. That's correct. Yes. And can you provide any proof of that? Well, if you're referring to tangible proof, um, we made sure that we did not have um, tangible proof on our, even when we had it, that we got rid of it. Uh, no, so the, so hard copy, no. Um, eyewitness proof, yes. I have other people that, that saw this as well. Unfortunately, they're not real happy about wanting to become public anytime soon. So those are astounding revelations from Russell Tice. He was a very highly placed uh, uh, NSA official. He had all the top security clearances. And there's one more clip here that's a little more amusing about a time when he was on a television show with uh, some of these targets. Let's listen. I mean, I was sitting there. I did an interview, I guess, with Larry King, and I had uh, Diane Feinstein and um, Orrin Hatch sitting next to me. And I knew that both both of them had been targeted by NSA, mm -hmm. and they're sitting right next to me. And of course, they're defending everything that's going on. It's, and I, I, you know, I wondered, you know, I'm thinking, you know, should I, should I say, oh, by the way, guys, <laughs> you know. So, what's your reaction, Heidi? 
Uh, it's instructive uh, to go back to the COINTELPRO days. Uh, you were referencing Frank Church and the so-called Church Committee, which when uh, it became public that the government under J. Edgar Hoover had been spying uh, and infiltrating, uh, you know, uh, religious and political leaders, Martin and, Luther and you, King. And you described the Fred Hampton case, the Black Panther leader in Chicago who was killed by police officers in his sleep. Exactly. And I think that uh, we all remember that J. Edgar Hoover amassed uh, voluminous dossiers on elected officials, uh, representatives, who knew he had the files and perhaps uh, were a bit, uh, you know, reticent in certain areas to speak out for fear of retribution. But Frank Church, uh, after an, uh, the committee investigated COINTELPRO, found that it was illegal, and called for the Attorney General to implement what became known then as the Levi Guidelines that really curbed uh, the ways that uh, FBI agents could open investigations on Americans. Frank Church made a wonderful comment. I can't repeat it verbatim, but he basically said that the NSA, uh, he had the foresight to know that the NSA could be used in tyrannical ways going forward and that there might not be a way to reverse that. I think had he known when it was coupled with technology, uh, really how out of hand it could get, but he recognized the power of the NSA. And I'm not surprised that our elected officials are being monitored. I think that we have to assume right now we're in a society where the media is monitored, our elected officials are being monitored, our, our allied nations are being spied on. And I think that the NSA is the most powerful entity in the world. And there's a quest to really amass an unprecedented amount of information and to really control information and ultimately, with uh, the assistance of large multinational corporations, to have uh, an effect on how we interact in communities, both politically and on a day-to-day -day basis. Knowing that we're being monitored or that the potential is there has uh, an overall chilling effect on how we exercise First Amendment protected activities. And so I when you see Senator Feinstein moving very quickly to push through some cosmetic changes through the Intelligence Committee and hopefully, she thinks, through the Senate, uh, do you think that she might be compromised? Do you think that she's doing this to please the people at the NSA? Or is this a heartfelt, you know, she likes a, a robust police operation? <laughs> um, we know that our politicians, I think we're in a period where being tough on crime and following the mantra of needing to defend our, our nation from terrorist attacks has become really, uh, we're in a state of perpetual war. And uh, that feeds into the need for, uh, or businesses meet the need by adapting new equipment and technologies to sustain that perpetual war, which I think is uh, the greatest threat to our democratic, democratic institutions. I think that. It could be either a combination of wanting to keep up that appearance, uh, but who knows what the internal relationships are because so much of this is covert. Mm -hmm. And our elected officials can't talk too much. Uh, businesses are bound by secrecy. And uh, I think it's time that uh, hopefully there will be a reversal of that trend of covert operations. And what will it take? Do we have the stomach for a new church commission? I hope we have a new church commission. I think we have momentum in that direction. I do believe there will continue to be, as we see on a near daily basis, new uh, exposés of programs that will hopefully continue to shock the conscience of the citizens. And I think that it's really rests in the hands of the people to hold our government in check. Certainly, uh, the media has been diluted by corporate control and by fear of even espionage or conspiracy charges being brought for protecting confidential sources. So well, you got Risen and Rosen. Risen and Rosen <laughs> from both sides of both the aisle. Both being brushed back. The New York Times and Fox News 
both have been uh, subjected to very invasive uh, surveillance efforts. Exactly. And um, it, there's also a program that Obama has, I can't remember the formal name, but it's basically uh, employees of the federal government who may suspect that a colleague might become a whistleblower have a duty to turn that person in. The problem, one of the problems with that is, for example, if you want to think outside the box to solve some of the complicated problems of the day, uh, are you going to be inclined to come up with creative and new ideas when they may seem to go against the grain and you may be turned in as a prospective whistleblower? I think that uh, we're seeing sort of a subduing of creativity and uh, willingness to speak out, which is why individuals such as Ed Snowden really stand out in stark contrast to the landscape. So I want to start to uh, take some of the emails, and I think people are tweeting in as well. And uh, if any of our studio audience members want to pose a question or make a comment, uh, why don't you stand up and we'll recognize you shortly. Jane and San Rafael asked, so what are the top five things we should do to stay underneath the radar, so to speak? <laughs> not doing anything other than living an ordinary life. So Jane, you've got nothing to hide. Just call the NSA and, you know, once a day you can report in. Or, hey, there's always Facebook. <laughs> right. Right. What, what are your recommendations, Heidi, for people who don't want to get caught up in the dragnet? The first recommendation, and I think that's happening on a national level, is uh, starting to become aware of the many ways that your information is not only gathered, but that you may willingly hand it over. Uh, we all know about sort of affinity programs, uh, customer loyalty programs. Maybe think twice before signing for that card and giving away personal information to get a rebate or a free cup of coffee. A, a simple thing that I always mention is don't give out your social security number. People sometimes, when they're given a form, feel they have to fill everything in. We're kind of an obedient nation. But there's uh, a red asterisk there. Exactly. <laughs> um, and what's the worst thing that can happen if you don't fill it out? Rarely have I filled that out and ha or not filled it out and had anyone say you have to. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we hand over our personal information. If you fill out a product registration form, for example, after you buy an air conditioner and it says how many family members do you have, what's your household income, don't fill that out. It's not necessary. Now take a moment here because one of the most astounding chapters in your book is about how the uh, Disneyland uh, chain of amusement parks collects information on our kids. And you know, the chapter on children was one of the last ones that I wrote, and I realized perhaps one of the most important ones because uh, so few protections currently exist. It's getting a little better with pressure from advocacy groups, but really when a child learns to type and use a keyboard, uh, they become vulnerable to online advertising by big groups such as Disney, uh, McDonald's, uh, Coca-Cola. At Disney World, for example, they may wear a rubber band. It's called a magic band. And if parental consent is given, it gather, they give your personal information, such as a child's birthday. And they say that it helps you cut through the long waiting lines to get into Disney World. But then. Uh, if little Jane passes by Cinderella on her birthday, Cinderella will say, Happy Birthday, Jane. But that shows, I think, the power that corporations wield in gathering our data uh, by saying that you'll get something in exchange, usually convenience. Mm -hmm. And that's what pervades our daily life in all aspects of technology. Yeah. But you never get it for free. You have to give something in exchange. Now, we've been focusing mostly on the government, but we need to be fair that Silicon Valley companies, the internet giants, collect all kinds of information on us. And just last week, uh, a federal judge in San Jose ruled that uh, uh, Google must proceed to trial on federal issues related to uh, uh, reading, uh, using automated devices to read people's emails in order to match up their interests with the right advertisements. And Google said that nobody should have any expectation of that kind of privacy, and it appears the court sharply disagrees. Which I think is a wonderful, hopefully, trend that we'll be seeing going forward. Google is interesting because 
uh, years ago there was a lawsuit where they had a so-called Street View program, I think, mm -hmm. and they were uh, collecting information through people's Wi-Fi uh, going in and gathering personal information. Uh, it turned out they blamed one engineer on that. But their argument was that, well, it's out there, it's free. And in fact, they were sued by several states in this country, had to pay fines. But I think this new case, which also involves Street View and the collection of data through Gmail, is very important because mm -hmm. it shows that we have a growing recognition that uh, just because we entrust some of our information and our email to Gmail and Google, for example, doesn't mean they can take it and then advertise to us and resell it to other entities as data aggregators do. Now, there may be more than one Street View case, but I read last week that one where the um, uh, uh, charges were sustained at trial was appealed, and last week Google lost that appeal yes. uh, before the Ninth Circuit uh, here in San Francisco. So th these are very interesting issues and important for people to be aware of. Christian in Woodacre writes, why isn't the average American more upset by this violation of our civil rights? Is it because they simply don't know it's happening? Ignorance of the law? Denial? I think it's all of those. Uh, when we go back and compare with uh, the revelations of COINTELPRO in 1971-72 when it was discontinued, we had a group of uh, people who broke into the offices uh, in Media Pennsylvania of the FBI, found the records, shared them with the media, and there was immediate public outrage. Part of the issue now is that in the last two to three decades, with the advent of the internet and technology developing so quickly, and with young people, quite honestly, being raised on that technology, and with busy life uh, enjoying the benefits of personal uh, computers, and related technologies. I think we've gotten used to um, dealing with things very quickly, having expediency, and not realizing that uh, with every interaction we expose ourselves to really having a profile drawn up by corporations and the government. So I think that in part we haven't realized the extent of this privacy invasion until recently. Uh, although some people who have been following it since 9-11, especially with warrantless wiretapping, have been aware of it. But uh, I think we've also been lulled into a certain complacency, quite honestly, by the large role that corporations play in our everyday lives. And they would like us to be uh, passive consumers mm -hmm. and not question their policies and the increasing role that they play in our society. Yeah, stop thinking, just go shopping. Exactly. We're great <laughs> consumers. We have a question from a member of our studio audience. Go ahead, sir. Uh, if Diane Feinstein or Church or yourself or Peter, for example, filed under the Freedom of Information Act, would you be able to get information that said these corporate groups that were sponsored by the government had been spying on you? It's an interesting question. I think what happens when you do file those uh, requests for information is if you get something back, it will be heavily redacted meaning a lot of the information will be blacked out. And in many cases, uh, you will have to ask many times to get the information. They have to be crafted in such a way that you know which governmental entity you're asking information from. So it can be an arduous process. And often it helps to have an attorney assist. I think that's a question we'll soon hopefully find out, the extent to which corporate partners are listed. Uh, I think that with fusion centers, for example, coming into prominence, uh, that will reveal that there are corporate partners involved if it comes out that someone was mentioned uh, in relationship to being monitored by a fusion center, as happened in Washington State uh, with the Army spying lawsuit that's ongoing now. But uh, it's hard to know at this point how much information will be revealed about corporations. I think that's something we should look for. Mm -hmm. Heidi, uh, th there, there are a number of issues that relate to the FBI, and its own Inspector General has reported the widespread abuse of the national security letters, which are instant warrants for an agent. And we recently uh, just confirmed a new FBI director for a 10-year term. This was one of the reforms after the Hoover era. 
Uh, now, just uh, parenthetically, they allowed the previous director to stay for 12 years in a 10-year term. And that was the subject of no debate. It was just uh, something that was kind of rubber stamped in Washington. So James Comey, who's not of the president's party, who was knee deep in the creation of uh, many of these surveillance systems, in the, he was the number two guy at the Justice Department under John Ashcroft. And he had a, a moment of heroism, I will grant him, at the hospital. People know about that, that story. Uh, but I'm really troubled that there was no serious uh, requirement of Mr. Comey to address the recent abuses of the FBI, to explain the, the killing of Ibrahim uh, Todeshev in Orlando, who's you know, remotely related to the Sarnayev brothers mm -hmm. in, in uh, the Boston bombing case. And that, of course, surfaced that in the last 140-some uh, cases of, of FBI shootings, there have been 140 uh, uh, findings that it was all justified, even in cases where they paid money damages to victims. And so it, it's astounding to me that we have now plugged in James Comey for a 10-year term without any examination. Well, you've got to look at the previous few administrations. We have uh, J. Bybee, John Yoo, writing the so-called torture memos that justify this country engaging in torture, uh, something that I think really should shock the conscience of the nation. We have uh, more recently secret memos justifying uh, abuse of the FISA courts and the blanket collection of so-called metadata. And the targeting of people for drone strikes, exactly. including American citizens. Exactly. Um, killings, extrajudicial killings that really uh, violate uh, so much of what we believe in in this country. I, I think it's worth mentioning to answer your question that we have a revolving door between high-level government officials and uh, CEOs of large corporations, the large uh, you know, military industrial complex, three and four star generals, for example, 80% of the retired ones go to work for private contractors who in turn advise the government on our national security policy. And Clear they show up as experts on television without any reference to what they did do and who they work for now. Exactly. <laughs> so I think we have a number of problems, one being accountability uh, in terms of all of our elected officials and potential conflicts of interest. We have a kind of lawless nation that seems to be able to write memo after memo justifying unlawful activities. And um, what I would say is, if there's any hope, it really, uh, there's a great book by uh, Jules Obel, who's president of the Center for Constitutional Rights, called Success Without Victory. And he talks about numerous court cases, including uh, ones against slavery, that have been brought year after year against enormous odds, knowing that they might not prevail in court. But the importance of them was getting the message into the public forum and rousing the populace, uh, you know, really getting people in the streets to get upset about these issues. And I think we need to see more of that to say, look, you're in office and you're not being honest with us you have conflict of interest, there's no transparency, and shame on you, we have to do something about this. So I think uh, American people have to really rise up and say, we don't want this anymore, we want some changes. Jimmy in San Rafael has emailed, knowing that our activist groups and peace groups have been infiltrated by undercover agents, will electronic surveillance technology be made available to local police, police who have interest in such organizations? And let me, let me pile onto that question because Marin County is one of the lucky jurisdictions that got a deal from the Department of Homeland Security on a new uh, MRAP. It's one of these hardened vehicles that's designed to withstand nuclear and biological weapons. And uh, they, I guess the, the grant was all but $40,000 of a $370,000 item. And they're doing this all over the country. Uh, surplus military supplies are being fed into the local uh, law enforcement pipeline. And so it's really concerning that we're seeing the militarization of, of ordinary crime fighting. 
We've seen the militarization uh, against domestic dissenters uh, and ordinary crime fighting uh, definitely in the last 20 years. And we've seen, I think, a repurposing of military equipment for domestic use. We have drones that will soon be filling our airwaves. Uh, I think air that's one on your shoulder. Oh, it just flew away, sorry. And uh, researchers at John Hopkins and other institutions are trying to make drones that are smaller macro UAVs on mandarial uh, vehicles, uh, potentially the size of mosquito that could fly into your living room, unbeknownst to you, and that can hover for longer periods of time than they already can. So we're seeing biometric ID uh, technology in hospitals, even in cafeterias for school children, to scan their palms to get in for lunch. Uh, I think that uh, unfortunately, some people are getting used to this technology in a First Amendment arena context, such as at mass assemblies, where we have not only police wearing uh, riot gear, but uh, less lethal, so-called less lethal weaponry used against passive crowds. Uh, and I think that when we see drones in the airways, we'll be seeing them mostly for surveillance and police use, and that could include deploying less lethal weapons from the airways. So it's, it's a frightening prospect. And just as I think we got a little uh, used to the whole torture thing, seeing it in the mass media on programs like 24, we see an increasing amount of militarization and police programs on TV, which is worrisome, because yeah. I think it reflects the fact that we're uh, getting little too used to those things. Mm -hmm. Lynn in Fairfax emails, can the genie ever be put back in the bottle? Or are we doomed to live in a society where privacy is nothing but a memory? Well, we've had uh, periods of what I would call crisis over our history. And I think, again, that it is a frightening prospect. We seem to be bombarded with a lot of this information recently, so it's a lot to digest. And certainly with technology being so uh, pervasive in our lives and the NSA so powerful globally, it's a difficult prospect, but I always believe in the power of the people and the power to exercise our right to protest and bring our grievances before government. Uh, we are really a nation of human beings, of individuals with un, you know, unlimited creativity and resourcefulness. And I always have hope that we can fight back against the system. Well, I appreciate your optimism. Teresa in Corte Madera asks, uh, you mentioned in your book that government surveillance affected the Occupy Wall Street protests. Will surveillance continue to hinder protests against the U.S. government? I think that protest will con continue to be uh, infiltrated, monitored, uh, vilified in the media with uh, protesters being labeled, as we're seeing a lot now, violent extremist anarchists. And what I would encourage people to do is to think of uh, any number of ways to protest being, uh, you know, on an individual level. Uh, I know that there's a community in California, for example, that didn't want drones in their, in their uh, jurisdiction, and they went to the city council, they fought it. They were victorious. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Alameda County, uh, the sheriff wanted drones, and activists, including people from the Bill of Rights Defense Committee, right. did an excellent job of uh, right. rallying. And, and it, it's not dead, but the drones aren't flying yet. Right. And I think that the more and more we hear of individual examples in the book, I call them custodians of democracy. Individuals, grassroots organizations that are fighting and really believing that we can be a nation that is strong and that protects ourselves, but that preserves our civil liberties and a sense of privacy and really personal autonomy. Um, I think that little stories uh, being shared can do a lot to change, really, the narrative that the government and corporations want us to live by. Mm -hmm. We have a question from our, a member of our audience. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, maybe you've already addressed this uh, in a sideways way, but I just wanted you to be explicit. What do you think the end game is, especially for the NSA? It seems to go, obviously, it goes way beyond dumbing us down and hypnotizing us for greater corporate profit. 
Well, I do think we cannot um, disregard the role that corporations and corporate profit plays because uh, at the end of the Cold War, there was a decrease in military spending. And uh, I believe that we saw at that point many companies, uh, Texas Instruments, for example, um, really thinking of ways to build their businesses, to come up with equipment that could be used in large part to conduct surveillance of certain segments of the population. So, for example, immigrants or inmates. And then what we've seen is uh, those growing in popularity and being mass marketed really to have uh, surveillance capacity over the general population. And I think it's been a supply and demand situation where those groups have marketed to the government. Uh, data aggregation has grown to be an enormous industry with Axiom in Texas being one of the largest that really collects consumer information for retailers but then comes up with clever ways to conduct profiles and sort of compartmentalize all of us for marketing purposes, but then to be resold to any number of entities, including the US government. So I do still think uh, the end game is, on one level, a justification of the need for national security. But I think it goes beyond that. There's a, a quest for empire around the globe to really control more and more of information and to insert ourselves into the businesses of other nations. Um, I, I think business is still a huge factor. Separate from the so-called war on terror, we have uh, a, a new category of domestic crime called eco-terrorism. And there was a very bad law that was uh, passed with little debate around 2005 that essentially ratchets up the penalties. So if, if I go vandalize the Kaiser uh, Hospital facility across the street, uh, it, it's a misdemeanor and you know I'll pay a fine or spend a night in jail. But if I did the exact same act at a facility that is designated for animal research or uh, has some other veneer of, of uh, a corporate <laughs> uh, uh, experimental place and my expression is in favor of animal rights, that same crime could draw a 20-year sentence. And uh, I, I, I want to single out Maxine Waters, the congressman from Los Angeles, because a couple of years ago I was interviewing her and I brought up her vote on this bill. She voted for it and she immediately said, you know, I really got that one wrong and I have never heard a member of Congress admit that before. But she said, you know, I didn't have time to read the bill and, the, you know, the summary looked okay. And then after I voted for it, I realized what a mess it is. Tell us a little bit about that. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, uh, the legislation was drafted by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the same conservative group that drafted the Stand Your Ground laws in Florida. Uh, and that is behind, their, it's primarily a corporate organization that works closely with legislators. That was a very bad piece of legislation because, as you say, it basically punishes individuals who engage uh, in acts of uh, protest uh, because of the nature of it, namely animal enterprise. And so if there's a loss of profit to a puppy mill or even a tertiary business that does business with that puppy mill, uh, the protester faces enormous fines and uh, an increased uh, jail or prison sentence. It's been adopted variants of it uh, on statewide levels across the country and I think that again it exploited fears of uh, eco-terrorism which itself was a term coined by a DC public relations company two or three decades ago uh, with very slick uh, advertisements portraying animal rights activists as mm -hmm. terrorists wearing Wouldn't that gas be our masks. our good friends at Hill and Knowlton? Hill and Knowlton, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, many government branches are beholden to corporate interests, uh, and it's something that when people really do the research and see how the laws came into being, 
and the effects. Because many animal rights activists would call the National Lawyers Guild and say, now with this new law, I'm afraid to go to a protest. And in fact, we can't say really what the law is because it's vaguely drafted, overbroad, and can be interpreted by courts mm -hmm. to encompass a number of lawful activities. Heidi, tell us about the National Lawyers Guild and what kind of case should I have if I bring it to you? What, what, what's your mission? What's your service area? The Guild was founded in 1937. Uh, at the time, as an alternative to what was then the racially segregated American Bar Association, we're a progressive organization of attorneys, law students, legal workers, and jailhouse lawyers uh, that believe that the law should be used really to improve society, uh, hold human rights above property interests. And uh, we're often called radical lawyers because we believe that lawyers uh, don't have to be neutral uh, and that they can actually advocate on behalf of social justice issues that we think are important. So for example, we have legal observers that uh, go to mass assemblies and observe police misconduct, but we won't do it as the ACLU does for the KKK because we, uh, we make judgments about uh, what we think uh, are important social issues. And we've mm -hmm. defended people during the HUAC House on American Activities right. Committee hearings McCarthy. and mm -hmm. McCarthy, and often individuals and groups that have been targeted by the government. Mm -hmm. And we ourselves were infiltrated and spied on for nearly four decades and yeah. tried to be labeled subversive by the FBI. I just have time for one more. Can you give us a quick <laughs> example of important cases that are on your, your desk right now? Well, our members across the country really do most of our litigation and advocacy, but some of the work we're involved in is defending what we call information activists or hackers. Uh, we helped defend Jeremy Hammond, uh, and we're interested in the case of Barrett Brown, who's mm. facing 105 years, right. a journalist, for uploading a link. Uh, but we do prisoners' rights, death penalty cases, economic and social justice. Mm -hmm. Heidi Bogosian has been our guest today. Her book is Spying on Democracy and is published by City Lights Books. The subtitle is Government Surveillance, Corporate Power and Public Resistance. We covered quite a bit. There's much more in the book and uh, I think it's a very comprehensive look at the uh, recent incursions on our constitutional rights and I hope you'll find it and pick it up and read it. Thank you for joining us today.